Hi, welcome to another video. So this is going to be pretty quick. This is just about finding the intersection of two functions. So I need to tell you how to do that, show you what it is that we're doing, what we're finding, and that you should, it should end with well an ordered pair because when two functions intersect, we get a point. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video. So we have just three examples. If you're ever asked to find the intersection of two functions, well, what we want to do is set those functions equal. So if the functions are the output of some set of some algebraic expression where we plug in a number and get an output, if we set our outputs equal, so basically this gives us an output, this is the output, we set them equal, we find out what x values will it take to get the equal outputs. And by doing that, we find out the points of intersection on two functions. So in other words, just set them equal. So we're going to say, hey, when this function equals this function, we're going to have an intersection. And so we do that. Now, what, what we're finding, what this really is, if you think about it, this is a parabola that's upward opening, and this is a constant, which is a horizontal line. So really what we're finding on some parabola and some horizontal line if those things intersect, it will be found by setting the functions equal, and we'll find the points of intersection at x, comma, a y. So we, we set the functions equal saying, hey, we want the y values or outputs to be the same. Find the x, this, the x values that give us those equal outputs, and that's going to give us the points where the x's are the same and the y's are the same in both of our functions. So when we do that, we're going to see some things that are really familiar. So we're going to see stuff that seems like it's from like maybe intermediate algebra. When you set functions equal to another, you go, oh, what should, I, what should I do to solve that? Well, with anything power two or higher, one of the best things we have is factoring or using some of the rational zeros properties we have later on. Uh, what we do is we get everything on one side. We get it in order. We get the first term positive. I know this sounds familiar. And then we try to factor it or use the square root method. Or if we can't do those things, we do quadratic formula. So we want to get everything on one side in order, first term positive and zero on the other side so that the zero product property works if we can factor it or quadratic formula works if we can't. So we'd subtract three and I want you to understand what happens when we do that. I'm going to write this a little funny. I want you to notice my original parabola is this x squared plus six x plus three. It's got a y intercept of three. If I plug in zero, you can see that. Now what happens when I subtract the three, this constant? Basically it shifts this parabola down. And it says, all right, if you shift this parabola down, the original parabola, subtract three, would shift it down three units. By finding the x-intercepts of this function, it's like finding the intersection of these two functions. So if we, it, it's kind of difficult to think of where this parabola crosses the y equals three line, or g of x equals three. But if I shift it down three units and think, well, you know what? Just shifting this parabola down so that it's kind of sitting on the x-axis, the x-intercepts are very easy to find. So by finding the x-intercepts of this function, we inherently find out the x-values where these two functions intersect. The y-values, yeah, we'd have to plug in, in our x's, but this will give us at least the x-values where our functions are going to intersect by finding the x-intercepts of a shifted down parabola. Now, how we solve it? Number one, we'd always try the square root method. And it's not going to work because we can't isolate our power two without getting the x on the other side. But what we can do, the next step would be factor. Remember that we can always factor a GCF if one exists. Here it does. We'd factor an x. And because we got everything on one side, we have a zero on the right hand side. The zero product property works. It says, yeah, we got a couple factors. Set each one equal to zero, no problem. Every factor that has a variable gets set equal to zero, and we get two solutions. We get x equals zero, of course, and if we subtract six, we get x equals negative six. Now, now listen carefully. What this is, what this represents, these represent the x-intercepts for this function. Why? Because you set it equal to zero. But what it also represents is the x values where this function and this function intersect. 
So this will intersect at x equals 0 and x equals negative 6. What we want to do is go a little bit further. We want to take those values and find the ordered pairs of intersection, where the points, you're trying to find the point here of where these two graphs intersect. So what we're going to do is say, you know what, from the x equals 0 and the x equals negative 6, we should be able to plug those into one of our functions or both of our functions if you actually want to check your work and see that this actually gives us what we want. So we're gonna create an ordered pair, zero comma some number, and negative six comma some number, because that will be our points of intersection from our graph stemming from the fact that we found the x-intercepts from a shifted down parabola. If we plug in zero here, we get zero squared plus six times zero, zero plus three is three. You go, wait a minute, can't I just plug in zero here and get three? Yeah, that's the whole point, right? That's a, that's a constant. So where this parabola would intersect this constant of three would have to be at a y value of three. In fact, we could just put three here. We know it's gonna intersect at something comma three because that's the only place a horizontal line, that's the only output of a horizontal line is three in this case. Now, what I did though is I checked my work. So I plugged in zero and said, all right, zero plus zero plus three is three. This is also three. That's how you check your work to make sure you have the correct intersection. Plug in your x value to both functions and it needs to be the same. That tells you that that one x value gives you the same output on both functions. That has to be a common point between the two and therefore an intersection. Try negative six. Negative six squared is positive 36. Six times negative, 30, negative six is negative 36. 36 plus negative 36 plus 3 is 3. Also, we plug it in here. Well, there's no place to plug it in. That's why it's called a constant, and you get 3. So we know that these two points are the two points of intersection of this parabola and that horizontal line. That's what we are doing when we're setting two functions equal, is we're finding the points of intersection. That's how you do it. Okay, let's move on a little bit. We have two other functions here. We've got f of x equals negative 2x squared plus 1. We've got g of x equals 3x plus 2. Before we go and find the intersection, I want to understand what we're doing. You need to know what that shape sort of looks like. You need to recognize it is a parabola, it's power 2, but it's downward opening. So this graph looks like this. Somewhere on an xy coordinate plane. I don't really care right now. We're going to find the points of intersection, uh, but I just want to get the picture in your head of what you're doing. This function is at a parabola. Well, no, it doesn't have power two. What it does have is a slope and uh, y-intercept. This is in slope-intercept form. It has a y-intercept of two. It's got a slope of three. So this is some sort of climbing functions, climbing line. It's a line because it has a slope and y-intercept. It's in that linear equation form. <clears throat> if this intersects, that's about where it's gonna, gonna be. So we're, we're gonna intersect this downward opening problem with some sort of a line. And that's exactly what we're finding. How to find that is set the functions equal. So we'd have negative 2x squared plus 1 equals 3x plus 2. From here, man, we don't need to keep the same nature of what these are. I don't really care that it's a parabola and a line. This is what you're finding. This is what you're going to know when you, when you solve this. But how to solve it doesn't care about keeping these forms. In order to solve this, we're basically going to change this to a different parabola. Find out what, where that parabola crosses the x-axis, and then those x-intercepts are going to represent the x-coordinates of the points like we did in the previous example. So what I mean by all that is, man, just do the same thing we've been doing. Let's get everything on one side. Let's get it in order. Let's get the first term positive. Let's see if the squared method works. If not, let's see if we can factor. If so, great, do it. We're going to be able to factor this. If not, we use the quadratic formula. But in all those cases, you want zero on one side first. Now, what's the appropriate choice? Should we move the stuff from the right to the left or the stuff from the left to the right? Well, it seems better to move the things from the left to the right so that our first term becomes positive. We want the x squared term to be the first term because it has the largest power. So if we add 2x squared and we subtract 1, so adding 2x squared, we get 2x squared. Subtracting 1, we get 1. Now we have this setup to look like a different parabola. Yes, this is an upward opening parabola. It's set equal zero, it's finding x-intercepts. But because we set this equal, this stemmed from this idea, the x's we get here, even though they represent x-intercepts for this function, they'll represent intersection values of x for these two functions. So we solve it the same exact way. Square method, not gonna work. Factoring, yeah, the factoring is gonna work. 
we know that we'd have three and two times one gives us two. We're adding to three, we're multiplying to two. They both have to be positive. They have to be two and one. So that adds a three and multiplies to two. I love the shortcut for this. At this point in our factoring lives, uh, we can use pretty much anything we want. I like doing the shortcut and simplifying. I showed this to you in another video. One factor here will be, look at your denominator. Your denominator says one factor will have one X and then you'll add one. This fraction says, denominator says you'll have two X's in one factor and you'll add one. Also, we learned that if we just change these signs, it will give us our X values. You can do that too. The factoring itself isn't really valuable for us right now. It's just getting us those X values of our intersection points. So by the zero product property, we can set these equal to zero. We'll subtract one. We'll subtract one and, add, and divide by two. And we notice that's exactly what we get here. This is the value one. If I change the sign, that's negative one. Here's one half, change the sign, that's negative one half. That's great, we can totally do that. If you don't need to show your factoring, you can go directly from here to the values of your, uh, so you, the x values of your points of intersection. Now, there is one thing that we wanna make sure that we do. We don't wanna leave it just as x values. Whenever you're finding uh, intersections, we wanna, we wanna get, leave them as points. We wanna get the point here. So to do that, I'm going to plug in negative 1. I'm going to do it to both of my functions. Why? Is it necessary? No, but it's a good idea so that we can check our work. So if I plug in negative 1, negative 1 squared is positive 1. Uh, positive 1 times negative 2 is going to give us negative 2. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. If I take negative 1, the same value, plug it in here, 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, plus 2 is negative 1. So I took this 1x value, I plugged it into both of my functions just to make sure that that gave me the same output. That totally uh, verifies that this is a point of intersection for both of our functions. So this is, <clears throat> looks like this point on our, on our graph. Let's plug in negative 1 half. If we plug in negative 1 half, negative one half to both of our functions, negative one half times three is negative three halves, plus two is positive one half. Now we better get the same thing if we plug in negative one half to our x value here. Negative one half squared is positive one fourth. One fourth times negative two is negative one half plus one is positive one half. So we know that this value plug into both of our functions gives us one half, that's the other point of intersection. So let's see, that would look something like Scale's a little off, but plug in negative one, get out negative one, plug in negative one half, get out positive one half. That's about where that function crosses the other function, where those two functions intersect. The X and Y axis aren't exactly right. I'm just kind of showing you um, a very loose visual interpretation of what's going on. That's a downward opening parabola. This is a positive sloped line, and we're finding where those things cross, doing it kind of a cool way. So let's come back, we'll do, uh, we'll do one more example. All right, last one. And again, what we've got here, we have two parabolas, and we're trying to see where those things intersect. One of them is upward opening, but a little bit stretched. A vertical stretch is gonna be narrow. One of them is a normal sort of parabola, not vertically stretched at all. So we have one like this, and one like that. And we're gonna find out these two points of intersection. How we do it every time, just set up equal. And we're going to go through the same process we do for solving for every single thing that has power two or more. We're going to get everything on one side in order, first term positive, and see if we can square root method, factor, or quadratic formula if we have quadratics. So let's get the stuff from the left moved over to the right by adding or subtracting respectively. Because that has a, a larger coefficient, we're going to do that. We don't want to move this over here or first term would be, be negative. So we're going to subtract x squared, add x, and subtract 1. That, of course, gives us a zero, which is really nice if factoring or quadratic form is necessary. We need that zero. And 
And it looks like this is going to factor, but I want to talk about what if it didn't. Square root method's off the table here. We can't do that. Uh, we definitely don't want to do complete and square root. We don't have to uh, because we have some e easier ways to go about doing that. So factor would be number one. And we do know that this is going to factor because we can find some numbers that add to negative 2 and multiply to 1 times negative 15. That's going to be a positive 3 and a negative 5. That adds to negative 2, that multiplies to negative 15. If that didn't work, right now you'd be doing the quadratic formula. And while you wouldn't find very nice values for your x, in this case x-intercepts, in what we're really uh, in the, the context of the problem, x values are the points of intersection, they wouldn't be nice, but they would be accurate. So the quadratic formula gives us things that are, are sort of hard to manipulate, but they are very important to be able to find. So if this did not factor, you do quadratic formula right now, and you'd have the x values from that of your points of intersection. What would be awkward is trying to plug them in and find output. That's where this would be awkward. That's why most of the time these things are factorable so that you don't end with, um, <laughs> with stuff from a quadratic formula. Because can you imagine? I'm making this up, but I mean, what if you had like 1 plus or minus square root of 3 over 1 plus square root of 3 over 2? and 1 minus square root of 3 over 2, something you could easily get from the quadratic formula. How would you plug that in? Well, you could do it, but it's going to give you something very, very awkward for your y coordinate. And we need to find ordered pairs, our points of intersection. That's the whole idea. So that's why most of these are factorable, is because you don't end with stuff that looks quadratic formula -y. Speed that up. Uh, you don't look, you don't end with stuff with, with radicals in it, essentially, if it's factorable. So again, Factor it. If it's not factorable, make sure you've really tried to factor it. If it's still not factorable, then do quadratic formula. You're going to end with some nasty x values of your points of intersection, but plug them in anyway. Don't use approximations. You have to use exact values. Unless they specifically tell you to use approximations, and then, of course, do it. <clears throat> so for us, since this is factorable, we also know our a is 1, which gives us something really nice. It's like a great shortcut we can use. Maybe double check our work, x squared minus 5x five, five plus 3x is minus 2x and then minus 15. Set both of these equal to 0 by the 0 product property. And we now have the x coordinates of our points of intersection of this parabola intersecting the other one. So basically our x values are this and this. If we plug them in to our functions, evaluate our functions at these values, we'll find the outputs. That's how functions work. Plug in the x, get down to y, that gives you an ordered pair. Also, we notice, man, if we just change these signs, we get the same values, you can, you can do that. So let's take negative 3, let's plug this in. We're going to do both of them just to make sure that we're right. So negative 3 squared, I'm looking at f of x, that gives you 9. 9 minus negative 3, that's 9 plus 3, 12. 12 plus 1 is 13. I'm going to write it down, but I'm going to also check over here. So again, 3 squared is 9. 9 times 2 is 18. 18 plus 9 is 27. And 27 minus 14 is, again, 13. So I know that this value of negative 3 in both of my functions gives me out 13. That verifies that that is a point of intersection. Now the 5, same idea. Take 5, plug it into both f of x and g of x. This is just a check your work sort of idea. So 5 squared is 25 minus 5 is 20 plus 1 is 21. That should be my output in both of these cases. Okay, so take our 5, 5 into the g of x now. 5 squared is 25. 25 times 2 is 50. 50 minus 15 is 35. And 35 minus 14 is 21. So we know that we have 5 being plugged into both of these or evaluated both functions gives us the same output. And that also verifies that's a point of intersection. So this is it. These are the two points where one parabola crosses the other parabola. That's what we're finding when we, when we set two functions equal to another, and that is how we find points of intersection of basically any two functions. Here we were just dealing with quadratics, or things that turn out to be quadratic. And in the future, though, if you have any two functions, you can set them equal to find points of intersection. I hope that helps you. I know it was a, kind of a quick video. Next time we'll talk about how we can use some quadratic methods for functions that aren't quadratic, and then we'll start stepping up into graphs of quadratics and some inequalities. So I'll see you for that.